J.P. Leung, an independent China strategist. Let me first begin with you, Mr. Sibyl, and a simple, straightforward question. What is the objective behind the Prime Minister investing so much time and energy in developing ties with the Middle East middle powers? Well, there are several objectives. One, of course, is that this is the source of 80 uh, percent of our energy. Uh, and, you know, any fluctuation in energy prices or any disruption uh, will cost India very dearly. So we have a very deep interest in peace and stability in this area, though we ourselves cannot control the situation there because there are other forces uh, at play. That is uh, one. The other, which you rightly mentioned, is uh, we have about 8 million or more uh, expatriates, three, three and a half million in the UAE alone. Earlier on, they were largely construction workers or low level, uh, holding low level jobs. But today they are in a sense running these economies at various levels, technically trained people, entrepreneurs, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, Third, of course, the remittances. Uh, which are uh, very, very large uh, and, uh, in fact, offset uh, to some extent. Uh, because we're the largest, World Bank has said that we are the country which receives the largest number of remittances uh, from abroad. So that helps to finance our deficits or trade deficits also. That is one aspect of it. The other is if you look at the uh, visions that UAE and Saudi Arabia and others have, these 2030 visions, uh, they really want to change course altogether. They're looking ahead to a situation where they will no longer be able to rely on hydrocarbons for their prosperity. So they must have a different template of development. And Saudi Arabia wants to be actually another Dubai and become a center of, uh, like Singapore, in terms of business uh, efficiency, as well as tourism and everything else. And UAE also has a 2030 vision. Uh, for India, there are huge prospects in terms of bagging contracts and being part of infrastructure development uh, in, in, in these countries. So they, they, on the reverse side, uh, they see India as a growing economy, mm -hmm. uh, the largest, the, 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 the fastest growing large economy, uh, going to become the third largest by 2027, 28 or whatever it is, uh, the biggest importer of energy <laughs> very soon, if not already. Uh, and uh, and having a rising international profile and the success of the G20 diplomacy and everything else and the fact that we've been able to keep our strategic autonomy and we don't have any expansionist ambitions and we don't interfere in their internal processes and give them lectures on this or that subject makes India a very safe and productive partner. And hence, they're turning towards India. There is the issue of food security. Uh, and India has a tremendous, there are tremendous possibilities here of having a food security lifeline between India and, uh, and these countries. On top of that, defense. India's rising defense profile, uh, its change of policies is willing now to sell arms and this and that. And a certain degree of disillusionment, disillusionment with the United States, which is moving away from this region as we know, because they have become self-sufficient in oil. And this, this region doesn't have the same strategic uh, 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 importance for them, barring, of course, the future of Israel, as we are seeing today, is leading to a lot of problems. So therefore, they want alternative partners. And India, with its uh, maritime security policies, its navy and everything else, is, is a partner. And India wants to do Atamir and defense manufacturing. These people, UAE, I know there have been talks where they are willing to invest in our defense manufacturing uh, with buyback arrangements and this and that, which if it uh, develops is a huge plus uh, for us. And then uh, in terms of uh, uh, the de-Islamization, the de-radicalization of these uh, societies uh, has very important implications in terms of our own subcontinent in terms of uh, elements in our own Muslim population, Pakistan, Turkey, the OIC in general, uh, because if these conservative Gulf monarchies take a very different line, mm. over time it's going to have a very salutary impact uh, on, uh, on the Muslim radicalization that we see globally on the issue of terrorism and everything else. And this is a huge safety valve 
huge safety valve for us. And when uh, people see how so-called uh, icon of Hindutva in India uh, is being fated and honored uh, in uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi, it sends a very powerful message. On top of that, he inaugurates the Ram Temple and then goes and inaugurates the Swaminarayan Temple in, in Abu Dhabi. Look at the message it sends. Look at the message it sends. So, uh, and, and the Prime Minister, I must say, has a tremendous knack of establishing personal ties. The manner in which he has established these personal ties with the, with the UAE Amir. Right. Uh, and, and the praise, he, and the lavish praise he, he, he showered on him in his speeches hmm. in, in Abu Dhabi uh, for the gesture he made to allow the erection of this temple, which would be Hindu in its characteristics. That's right. Uh, I think was well-deserved was well deserved. So he knows that in these countries, personal relationship, personal equations, personal chemistry is very important in terms of okay. foreign, po so, foreign so, policy. So, so let me bring in uh, Mr. Swaran Singh also. Mr. Swaran Singh, uh, where has the Prime Minister succeeded where perhaps other Indian leaders, I wouldn't say failed, but perhaps have faltered or underassessed the potential of ties with the Middle East specifically Gulf countries, UAE, Qatar, Oman, Saudi Arabia. In other words, what has worked for the Prime Minister? There is no denying of the fact that today India has friendly relations uh, with the whole spectrum of uh, nations in the Middle East. Nations that often do not uh, sort of see eye to eye with each other uh, are all friendly to India. There is no doubt about it. But of course, this has been a continuous process in the making. For example, till 70s, most of these countries in the Middle East uh, that we are engaging today, they were smaller clans and smaller counties and cities. They were not really on a global platform at that time. It is only discovery of oil that transformed, first of all, their economic profile. And of course, it has resulted later in change in their uh, societal leanings uh, and of course, uh, to some extent, political reforms that we see more recently. Likewise, in India's case, till 71 particularly, Pakistan was the world's largest Muslim country, had a certain leverage in engaging with these Middle East nations, which are largely ruled by families. And India has also transformed Pakistan, broke into two. So it's a continuous process which has seen accelerating pace every next year in that sense. And now, of course, with the hyperactive foreign policy under Prime Minister Modi, we see that personal bonhomie that he's able to bring about, uh, particularly uh, creates very good uh, outcomes in case of Middle East, which are largely uh, you know, ruled by families. And those are the people, individuals who take decisions uh, in, the, in, in each of these countries. And therefore, that personal bonhomie and engagement makes an enormous difference to complementarities that have evolved over a period of time. And on top of it is for India, Indian citizens, people of Indian origin, who are contributing enormously to the development in our country in India. Remittances of Indians coming from foreign countries annually are even today more than the total FDI and foreign aid put together. So there is a direct connect, societal connect connection in India's development, whether it is you know, at the level of technology transfers or it is helping various Indian families in terms of remittances coming. So complementarities on both sides, not just Indian side, both sides were evolving over a period of time. And now, of course, the fact that India's leadership at the very top is able to connect with each of these leaders at, at the level of uh, personalities uh, facilitates it, makes uh, the process far more accelerated, makes it a matter of celebration. And of course, engaging diaspora and culture has always been very, very, very clear front focus of Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy. His engagement with diaspora makes it very important for these countries to see how popular he is at home with Indian diaspora and of course around the world. So complementarities are being maximized with this personal relationship that Prime Minister Modi is building with each of these leaders.